You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hi, Chad Franson here, one of the hosts of Share Your Voice, where we talk with top-notch law firms and lawyers about what it takes to grow a successful law practice. This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing, delivering tailor-made services to help you accomplish your objectives and maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and make sure you're getting the best ROI, your firm needs to have a better website and better content. Gladiator Law Marketing uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decades of experience to outperform the competition. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com, where you can schedule a free marketing consultation. Douglas S. Lodmel is the managing partner at Lodmel and Lodmel PC. Born in Geneva, Switzerland, he holds a Juris Doctorate from Cardozo School of Law. Douglas specializes in estate planning, taxation, and strategic asset protection for both domestic and international clients. He is author, notably, of The Lawsuit Lottery, The Hijacking of Justice in America. With his extensive experience, Douglas is a frequent guest speaker at various professional conferences and seminars across the country. He also shares his knowledge in asset protection with other attorneys through continuing legal seminars. Doug, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Yeah, my pleasure, Chad. I'm good. Hey, uh, tell me, when did, when and how did you know you wanted to become an attorney? <laughs> That's funny. Um, so my father's an attorney, and uh, I assumed I would never want to be an attorney. Um, so I didn't even consider it. Uh, I I just didn't even think about going to law school. Um, and then I was working in New York. I was in Wall Street doing uh, risk 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 management, and um, I wanted to get married. And I started thinking about how I'm going to support a family. And all of a sudden, I thought of law school. I thought, well, maybe it's not such a bad idea. So at, from there, I went, and and the rest is history. How did you? Uh, so you you obviously you applied to law school. To law. How did you get started in the legal industry? So again, my dad was an attorney, and so I I did um, I did really well in law school. I've got lots of opportunities with big firms in 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 New York. Um, I did I did clerk with one of those firms and kind of got the vibe and okay how does this work? Um, I got the opportunity to clerk with Jack Weinstein in the Eastern District of New York, a very very famous district court judge. He wrote Weinstein on evidence. He's kind of, you know, a, 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 an icon. Um, sitting in his chambers for six months every day gave me a really good insight into the actual legal system, how it works, what a, what a courtroom really feels like, and what judges really do. Um, and so it, it was just very interesting because all that experience, um, I realized, gosh, I, I want to do something um, that is not in that that is somehow helpful in the legal industry somehow wanted to be the good guy attorney so to speak right not the not the shark trying to take advantage of the system because it is it was it was apparent to me that taking advantage of the system is a big chunk of the legal profession um and so um my father was doing asset protection and we actually you know i didn't intend to go into practice with him but by the time i i was in my last year i was in i was in practice with him and that was it so i'm guessing Lodmill and Lodmill refers to you and your father correct yeah exactly how long have you guys been together in terms of uh, you know, practice 26 years of practice yeah you know? wow awesome uh is yeah. it um I guess you probably wouldn't know much different, but is there is there challenges that come with working with family, especially with a parent? Um, yeah, there there are challenges because you know you're you've got the family dynamic, um, and I learned a lot through this process. And you know, today a lot of what I learned, I I, I also have two brothers. I started a company. My brother was involved with Lodmel Lodmel. My other brother and I started a company, and so I've got a lot of experience working with family, and. Um, what I've learned is is that you've got to not treat family differently than you would treat a third party outside partner. You've got to set up the rules, you know, all the all the guidelines for what it's going to take to be successful. Um, and, you know, especially the exit plan. So if somebody wants to kind of exit the active job part of building the business and just be an owner, you got to segregate those two roles. You know, you got to pay yourself for working in the business and then you pay yourself a different amount of money for owning the business. Um, that's the trick. That was the key. Um, I got it wrong the first time. I got it right the second time. And, and, it, and it, it really makes a huge difference. It's something I tell clients all the time. 
you know, and, and that's whether it's just a regular partner or a family or anything else. Um, I see people make that mistake and everybody's all in. OK, we're just going to do it. They don't talk about the roles. And then somebody kind of once they become successful, somebody says, okay, well, my, my part is really kind of done. But they haven't, you know, the guy who's still managing is getting taking the same draw as the guy who's sitting on the beach. Yeah, sure, sure. So, hey, tell me a little bit about your book, The Lawsuit Lottery, The Hijacking of Justice in America. That's a that's a pretty bold, bold title. Um, explain the title for me and kind of what expired the book, uh, what inspired the book. Well, um, look, our legal system was designed the, by lawyers. I mean, the founding fathers were by and large lawyers. Um, lawyers were uh, um they understood the risks of letting the lawyers get control of the system um it was it was it was very apparent and so there was very strong um inside the constitution provisions that really were designed to discourage lawsuits um you couldn't take contingent fees as attorney um, the, the, uh, you couldn't advertise. They didn't want you drumming up business out there. Um, the, the ethical rules were extremely strict about, about, you know, chasing ambulances. You can get disbarred and you could get thrown in jail over it. Um, and then, you know, the civil rules of procedure were, it made it very hard to file a lawsuit. You had to be very specific. You had to really know you couldn't just throw something at the wall and see if it sticks. Um, and, you know, I don't think our modern lawyers noticed that that's all gone. You know, 1964, Maine was the last state to lift the prohibition of a contingent fee for an attorney. Um, advertising, 1977, it was an Arizona case that that went to the Supreme Court where a law firm wanted to advertise, and they said, "Well, okay, but you can only advertise your prices and you know your location." Well, we see how that's out the window. With you know, I got me fifty million dollars from you know. Joe Blow and Joe Blow, they're the best PI attorneys in the country. Um, the ethical rules were actually modified. The, the, the ABA modified the, uh, the model ethical rules. And if you look specifically at the part around ambulance chasing, they just changed a couple of words that completely gutted any kind of teeth that that has in it. Um, then, of course, the rules of civil, civil procedure that used to make it very difficult to file lawsuits were twisted around. And now it's very, very easy to file a lawsuit. You don't even need to know what you're suing for. You can just get into discovery and hope you can figure it out later. And look, there's there's some good reasons for all those changes, but by and large, they were driven by the plaintiff's bar and the you know the desire to have more lawsuits, which generates more revenue. In the book, I point out that 22%, only 22% of the money that ever goes through the legal system ever gets to the plaintiff, the the, the you know, the the aggrieved party. Um, the rest of it is is going to the lawyers and and the system around it. Um, you know, uh, if you go to any conference or or you talk to any group of lawyers, by far the wealthiest group of lawyers, the only lawyer that's ever been on the fortune, you know, the the billionaires list is they're all plaintiffs attorneys. Um, and I don't have anything against plaintiffs attorneys. I think they serve a very important function in society. We need to create that accountability. But I have seen firsthand plaintiff's attorneys off the rails, and it's it becomes just purely about the money. Our incentives around the legal profession have been twisted now. And unfortunately, I think it has taken our legal system off the rails. And, and now, um, if you have any kind of wealth in this country, I can tell you, people are scared. They're scared that it's going to be taken from them through the legal system. And so, you know, that's really what what would cause me to pick the other side of the table and create, you know, a law firm that does the opposite. I protect assets. Very nice. What uh, what would be like a primary takeaway? Maybe you just maybe you just explained it like a how would what would be like an enlightening moment from the book? You know, like, uh, OK, my perspective is different now. Or did you just or is that or is the perspective what you just shared? Yeah, I mean, it, it. You know, it's funny because that book is very old now. It's not. Mm. You know, it's not recent. It's been. It's been out for geez, almost twenty years, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is uh, this is something. But it's it's very much the same. I think I, I call it a, a legal extortion in the book. Um, it's pretty easy to use the legal system to extort money from people. Doesn't take much if you sue somebody and you ask for an amount of money that is anywhere within the realm of what it could cost them to defend it's cheaper to pay. And, and to me, that's the definition of extortion. I'm going to do something to you. I'm going to make it worth your while. That's what they're doing when they steal your data and, and they hijack you, you know, for 
I'll give you your data back um, for this amount of money. It's not too high to where you say no, you know, it, but it's but it's significant. Um, the legal system has been doing that legally for years. I mean, that is our system. And so I see plaintiff's attorneys, that's that's their business. They just sit there and sue people for, you know, just the right amount of money to where they can pay, they can pay it. Um, insurance companies have also been off, wrapped up into this. Um, for years, I think we saw them kind of, giving into that and then uh, eventually they started saying no we're gonna we're gonna stop that because this is this has gotten out of hand and again it's i don't want the takeaway to be that i'm i'm anti-plaintiff attorney or anti-legal system i think our legal system is is the foundation of our democracy it's incredibly important but that's why i'm 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 upset or sad or discouraged that it has been hijacked and we don't have any controls on it and you know there's no loser pay system Chad, if I sue you, you run up 200,000 legal bills, the odds of me being you know, held responsible to pay back your legal bills, even when you win the case, are close to zero. So you know, what's the disincentive for me to give it a shot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see where it's from. Hey, as I mentioned, uh, some of your specialties include estate planning, taxation, and um, strategic asset protection. Um, if you could just tell me kind of what are, what are the initial steps involved in asset protection? So asset protection is is basically the area of law that takes your looks at your assets and says, can we structure your assets in such a way that should you end up with a liability of, of you know judgment against you, it would make it difficult, if not nearly impossible, for that a judgment holder to reach the assets. The goal being to create the the, the leverage needed for a reasonable settlement, right? So asset protection is not, not just about telling everybody to go pound sand. It's about creating, it's about rebalancing the playing field, right? And so mostly it's used before we ever get to a trial. Um, and, you know, some of the common things that you all know about are LLCs or a form of asset protection, because, you know, if your assets are in an LLC, if done right, a plaintiff with a judgment against you can't foreclose on the LLC and just go in and reach the assets. They, they can get a charge against your interest called a charging order. And this creates some level, right? So if you stack that up and maybe use an LLC for your you know, real estate investments, and then you use a holding company in, an, in a different jurisdiction that has also very good charging order protections, now you've layered it up. So you've got two. And then on top of that, you know, asset protection heavily utilizes what's called an asset protection trust. And that trust really could be done in three different ways. It could be fully offshore in a jurisdiction like the Cook Islands or Nevis or Belize. It could be done fully domestically in a jurisdiction like Alaska, Nevada, Wyoming, Delaware, or it could be done in a hybrid fashion. So, you know, my claim to fame is really the hybrid version of that, which is called a bridge trust. Um, and what it is, is it's a foreign asset protection trust that is bridged back and for tax purposes, treated like a domestic trust. And so it's very simple to manage, but should it need to be used, it's actually a foreign trust. And we just cross the bridge and we drop the U.S. jurisdiction. And now we have foreign trust, which is really acknowledged as the strongest form of asset protection trust in, in the world. How does estate planning fit into asset protection? Yeah, it's a great question. So estate planning is, is for me, the way I see it is that asset protection is kind of do it first um, because you fund things differently. So if you do an estate plan with a revocable living trust, for example, um, you're just, your attorney is going to tell you, put everything in the revocable living trust. And then you come to me and you say, okay, now I want to do an asset protection plan. And I say, okay, take everything out of the revocable living trust and let's put it over here because the revocable living trust is not an asset protection vehicle. So for me, it's better to do asset protection first to design your asset protection structure and then look at the estate planning and determine, do I need still a revocable living trust that, you know, the, the for example, the bridge trust would pour down it into, do I need children's trust? Do I need life insurance trust? You know, what kind of estate planning? But you're doing it from the position of I've already got my assets in this protected structure. So it it much it works much better to, to see it as asset protection first, estate planning as the as the second step. Can you explain to me a little bit about the concept of uh, the pyramid of asset protection? The pyramid of asset protection. Where does that come from? Oh, no, no, I, I thought I noticed during my research and I'm not that familiar with it. I thought I thought you might be, but uh, maybe that's no. just my. No, oh, yeah. I mean, that sounds like somebody's, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, own structure, but it's not something I'm familiar with. 
Sure, sure. Hey, uh, during your um, tenure or your kind of your lifespan with um, Lodmel and Lodmel, um, is there like a moment that you're particularly proud of or that stands out to you like, like, yeah, I love that? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I think all attorneys and all professionals, really, I think the first 10 years of your professional life, you're really trying to get your feet under you. Um, you're trying to figure out, you know, who you are. Um, and you're also trying to develop the skill set that really allows you to, you know, see um, how, how you're going to, you know, express your own creativity through it. Um, so, so thank God I had a, a partner who was a father who, who was able to mentor me through that. So I think that was easier to have somebody that really already had that, you know, experience and was, was pulling me along. But I will say that, you know, somewhere around that 10, 11, 12 year mark, it kind of clicked and I realized, wow, I really do understand this. I am really quite good at it. And um, the biggest skill that I have is not drafting documents. You know, that's, that's uh, one day we won't even do that. AI will do it for us. But the biggest skill is actually talking with clients and helping them understand the position that they're in, the risks that they're dealing with, um, and, and emotionally helping them, you're coaching them through it. And so somewhere in there, I kind of realized I, I started seeing myself not as a drafting attorney that had this technically perfect thing, but as a coach and support network for my clients, such that they really were able to, to see me and come to me for, for anything. And so, you know, certainly there were some big successes along the way where the plan worked and the client was literally saved. Um, and, and those were impactful, but I think that the moments leading up to those, the, 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 the many, many calls when they're freaking out and feeling like, you know, is this really going to work? Those were even more important. And I can tell you today, you know, 26 years later, um, as, as a, I hate to say it, but, you know, a, a senior attorney, <laughs> you know, uh, somebody who's been around the block. Um, I definitely see that as my role. I'm really a consultant and an advisor to my clients, much more than a, you know, a technician that drafts legal documents. Sure, sure. So, speaking of advice, at what point would you say someone should start building their asset protection, you know, structure? Well, since asset protection begins with really simple stuff like an LLC, I would say, you know, as soon as you have your first assets that you want to protect, whether that's a single family rental home or short term rental that you know you you bought um even your primary residence um your first you know $50,000 that you've saved that, that's already a good time to start because you don't necessarily need to wait till you've got millions of dollars to to say okay well you know wow I should do something um if you start now and you build you're going to build a better structure you're going to be building into that structure i think you're going to actually save more money and invest more money because you've got like the piggy bank sitting on your kid's dresser versus a change drawer. You know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's something that you actually feel like you're building. Um, so I would say right away, like, you know, almost immediately now, now when do they need kind of the full plan with the asset protection trust and, and, you know, the holding company and all that, you know, that usually begins around a couple million dollars of net worth that needs protecting. Um, Is and, and that includes, you know, everything there, real estate, their house, their cash, their stocks, everything. Is a do-it-yourself approach advisable? Um, you know, to a point, I think it's okay. I, I'm not, I'm not anti-do-it-yourself. Um, if, if you can do enough research and realize, hey, I'm buying my first short-term rental, it's going to be $180,000, I'm putting $40,000 down, and, you know, I'm money is tight and I want to do something. Um, and I've gotten enough advice to know that an LLC in the state where I'm buying the rental is probably a good first choice. And I can do that myself online for a couple hundred bucks, or I can hire an attorney for a couple thousand and I need to save the money. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with doing it yourself. But there is a point at which you're going to run out of the do it yourself capacity. Um, and so, you know, you, you just want to be aware because I do have people call me that they've done it themselves so long that it's difficult for them to pay for it or, or even take advice. Um, so don't let yourself get caught into, you know, I can do it forever. I have one more question for you, but first tell me how people can find out more about Lodmel and Lodmel. Uh, well, I mean, our website is, is, is great. Uh, Lodmel.com, lots of resources on there. Um, or you can, you can just email support at Lodmel.com and say, Hey, I heard, I heard Doug on the podcast and um, you know, I'd love to talk to him. 
you know, is this podcast is mainly for attorneys, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you know, one of the things that I did about 10 years ago was I started something called the Asset Protection Council. And that is a council that I invite attorneys to join. It, it provides education around asset protection and resources to help them add this to their practice. Um, this is a practice area that is so good for so many different attorneys, especially estate planning attorneys. But business planning attorneys, any attorney that has the client profile that we just talked about, um, you sh it, it, it behooves you to be able to offer and speak about asset protection. Now, are you going to be ready to do it, at, especially at that highest level for the, you know, right away? You're really not. So it gives the it gives a resource so that we can co-counsel on those cases. And so they can they can start, you know, providing the services. So um, that's assetprotectioncouncil.com. And I would strongly encourage you to go and check that out if you're an attorney. And um, and then, yeah, just email support at liveville.com um, and say, hey, I'd love to talk to Doug about the Asset Protection Council and, and see if I'm a fit. Okay. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, uh, last question for you. Um, you mentioned you, your father is a mentor for you. Can you think, uh, is there something maybe he's told you a million times along the way or something he, to he told you once that you'll never forget? Like what, what's some advice that he's given you that, that really has helped you? You know, that's, that is a, another great um, question. Um, I can tell you that the, the thing that he told me that I still use every single day of my life is that all things work to perfection. So when you are feeling like it's kind of not going your way, um, when I'm feeling like it's not going my way, I, I fall on that and I say, OK, well, there must be a reason for this, um, because we all have challenges, professional challenges, personal challenges that they are they are they are part of the human experience and having that fundamental belief structure that it's there's a purpose for it let me find it whether it's true or not is kind of irrelevant to me because i know it's helpful and because it's helpful i continue to support that and when things aren't going my way and i'm looking at it and saying geez this seems like it's all bad here um uh, i i start looking for how it might be good and just that exercise of looking all of a sudden i see something um because a lot of times what's happening is happening at 90 degrees to where you're looking and sometimes you know, you the roadblock here is really just to get you to turn your head here and see what's really there for you. So that was that's been his greatest greatest piece of advice and gift to me. Great, very nice. Hey, uh, Doug, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks so much for your time and all of your insights. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, Chad. Great talking. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to Fifteen Minutes. Be sure to subscribe, and we'll see you next time.